again. Uh, we have two folks representing NAEMSP, Dr. John uh, Ling, uh, Emergency Physician and Medical Director of North uh, Memorial Health Ambulance and Air Care at North Memorial Healthcare in Minnesota, as well as Dr. Matthew Harris, who's an Emergency Physician at Children's Hospital Colorado. Uh, Dr. Ann Dietrich will be representative for the AEMT, and Tracy Cleary will be representing ASEMSO, and uh, Meg Megan Hollern uh, is the certification analyst with NREMT. So that is our advisory committee. Additionally, we have uh, set up, uh, we've got some subject matter experts that will be helping each of the teams. Um, Dr. Brian Moore, uh, Dr. Greg Ferris, Dr. Tony Gross, uh, Dr. Kathleen Adelgase, Dr. Julie Leonard, Dr. Lauren Brown, um, Travis Adams, who is actually um, a, a PEC with the um, uh, in North Carolina, Lina, and I, Gaston County, um, Gaston County, North Carolina. Travis Adams has joined the subject matter expert team as well as Dr. Kathleen Brown. Uh, I'm sure a lot of those names are familiar to many, uh, many folks on the call. So the objective of this collaborative, as I'm sure you all know is, uh, as you are writing the grant, is to form a co cohort of state um, partnership grantees uh, to participate in a learning collaborative that will demonstrate effective, replicable strategies to increase the number of local EMS agencies with a PEC. And a focused aim of the collaborative is that by March 31st, like next year, uh, all nine participating states will have established a PEC in more than 50% of local EMS agencies who indicated an interest in adding this role on the national uh, EMS survey from uh, 2017 to 2018. So just a little bit of background. Um, I know you all have um, seen this uh, document, the uh, Growing Pains Emergency Care for Children that came out of the Institute of Medicine. Um, many of the, the documents that I'm going to be reviewing quickly um, were authored by many of our SMEs and advisory committee uh, members. Um, and just for those of you who may not be uh, familiar with them, we're just going to briefly review a couple of these documents um, and kind of a background on where the concept of the pediatric emergency care coordinator comes from. So in 2017, or oh, that, not that soon, um, 2007, IOM released um, the Growing Pains document, which specifically recommends that EMS, EMS agencies uh, designate a pediatric emergency coordinator to ensure that training and guidelines are available to field providers to maintain competence in the emergent care of children. This rose, ro, uh, this role is now commonly referred to as the Pediatric Emergency Care Coordinator, or PEC. Um, this re report also suggested that individual filling this role would serve as a resource to oversee any pediatric care quality improvement initiatives within the agency, provide skills-based training to agency staff, and assure that all medications, equipment, and supplies needed for the care of a child are stocked and available in all responding vehicles. So um, then came uh, in 2016 a policy statement from the National Association of EMS Physicians that supported having a PAC in EMS agencies in order to augment and advise EMS medical directors and ensure that pediatric needs are appropriately and reasonably met. And in the same year, uh, the uh, resource document coordination of pediatric emergency care and EMS systems was published in pre-hospital emergency care. Uh, the conclusion of this document um, stated that EMS PEC facilitates integration of pediatric needs into all aspects of EMS, and that EMS agencies may benefit from having a PEC based upon results received from the pediatric verification programs for emergency departments.
And Sam, is this next uh, group of NEDARC slides? NEDARC slides, NEDARC slides, NEDARC slides, NEDARC slides, NEDARC slides, NEDARC slides, Cassidy? I'm here. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks awesome. for giving Thank me a you. chance to present these these slides, you guys. This is Hillary Hughes. I work with NEDARC, which is the National EMS Data Analysis Research Center. And we're going to talk a little bit about a recent national survey we did looking at the presence of a PEC in EMS agencies. Go ahead and advance, please. So we did a survey over the past year or so, um, more like a year and a half, and we looked at all 58 states and territories using our EMS uh, state partnership grantees, surveying all EMS agencies that respond to 911 calls and who are not just uh, solo military or air transport type agencies and um, tried to figure out, uh, according to these performance measures, how many agencies currently have a pediatric emergency care coordinator. We surveyed uh, thousands of agencies, over 11,000 agencies were contacted. Go ahead and advance. And we had about 79% of our agencies responded for a total of 8,730 agencies surveyed. Advance. And what we found with this survey is that the majority of EMS agencies in the states and territories currently are ALS licensure agencies, about two thirds followed by a third being BLS agencies. Go ahead and advance. And we looked at the individual, oops, sorry, if we go back one, if we look at the individual providers, about 50% are EMT level providers and about a little over a third are paramedic providers. We can go forward now. And we all know part of the reason we are all doing what we do is we know that pediatrics is a low percentage of pre-hospital call volume. And we surveyed how often uh, people respond to pediatric calls. And you can see on this slide that almost 80% of EMS agencies see a low to medium call volume of pediatric patients. So they're seeing less than 100 pediatric calls in a year or less than eight calls in a month. And if you bring that down to the level of a day, they're only seeing one pediatric patient every two to three days. And that's if you look at the upper limit on these, on these numbers here. So very few agencies are seeing uh, volumes of pediatric calls where they can uh, feel really comfortable seeing these patients, you know, getting multiple calls on a pediatric patient a day. Go ahead and advance. So for those of you not familiar with the EMSC performance measures, I think most people are, but these are performance measures that are designed um, through a group effort to look at different goals that we uh, reach out to for um, for our program, and the performance measure two was a percentage of EMS agencies in the state or territory that have a designated individual who coordinates pediatric emergency care. And the goal for this performance measure is that by 2026, 90% of EMS agencies in each state or territory will have a designated individual who coordinates pediatric emergency care. And we don't, that, that wording of designated individual, I think was a little bit confusing, but really just want a person or persons who are in charge of making sure that pediatric needs are met within each agency. We can go ahead and advance. So currently, the results of this survey showed that about 23% of agencies have a PEC, and another third, another 27% or so, have interest in adding a PEC or currently have plans to add a PEC. Unfortunately, there's about half of agencies who either don't have a PEC or really aren't thinking about adding a PEC currently. And then we, we talked about, you know, this role of a PEC is a little bit fluid and about three quarters of agencies currently have this role fulfilled by a person or persons who are just working with in their own agency. And about a quarter of the time, it's a, a person who helps coordinate pediatric care among multiple agencies. Can advance. And this is a, a bar graph on the bottom that you can kind of see where, where we are currently towards meeting this performance measure. Each of those little dots represents an individual state or territory. 
um, and where they fall in that range of, of meeting that performance measure. We break it down our performance measures into a timeline, and by 2020, we want to see 30% of EMS agencies in each state and territory having a PEC, and then again by 2026, getting that goal up to 90%. So you can see there's quite a few states or territories that are close to that 30% mark, which is our first benchmark coming up in 2020. There's a couple states or territories that have already exceeded that, and there's a few that are trailing, and we're hopeful this collaborative will help make that those little blue circles surpass that red bar. We can advance. We also asked as part of the survey the roles and responsibilities that PECs fulfill if someone does have a PEC associated with their agency. And you can see the, the longer the bar, the more times different agencies said that the PEC fulfilled this role. So the most common roles and responsibilities that PECs have are ensuring that fellow providers follow pediatric clinical practice guidelines and protocols, promoting pediatric continuing education opportunities, ensuring the availability of pediatric medications, equipment, and supplies, overseeing pediatric process improvement initiatives, and ensuring that the pediatric perspective is included in the development of EMS protocols. And a lot of that information echoes what was just presented from that Institute of Medicine report. Less likely are things like making sure that agencies are involved in pediatric research efforts and promoting family-centered care. We can advance. And then we look to see if, if being a different, if the different levels of licensure affected who and who does not have a PEC. And what you can see from this graph, those blue bars on the top, um, that first row is the different agencies that have a PEC according to what level of licensure the agency carries. So if you are an ALS agency, you are more likely than a BLS agency to have access to a PEC. And you can also see that the ALS agencies had a little bit more interest in adding a PEC at this time as well. We can go in advance. And then we looked at the presence of a PEC versus pediatric call volume. And again, you can see that the agencies with medium high or high pediatric call volume were also more likely to have a PEC and be a little bit more likely um, to have plans or in progress to moving to make a PEC available to their agency. And these results kind of mimic the last National Pediatric Ready Survey where we found that Hospitals that had higher pediatric call volume, or excuse me, hospitals that had high, higher pediatric volume also tended to have a little bit um, more likely to have a, a PEC at their, at their hospital as well. So we can see a trend there. I think that might be my last slide. And if anyone has any questions, they're welcome to reach out to me. If they have any questions about the survey or the process, um, please let me know. Uh, you can reach out through NEDARC. And I appreciate you guys letting me present those slides. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Hughes. So at the end of last year uh, and the beginning of this year, the EMS for Children Innovation and Improvement Center facilitated um, a qualitative study to um, identify promising practices from EMS agencies in several states that have a pediatric emergency care coordinator and for a method to verify skills competency <laughs> pediatric uh, specific equipment. Uh, this was a qualitative health services study of EMS systems in six states. Uh, EMSC-based interviewers identified systems representing varied geography, response levels, and administrative structures that had a PEC or skills competency verification process. They contacted EMS agency administrators to conduct audio recorded semi-structured interviews to assess current practices in their systems. Interviews were interviewed by two investigators, two investigators using comparison analysis, analysis both themes both until themes saturation. Until saturation. Several themes emerged from the 17 EMS administrator interviews, and three identified were uh, about the PEC were roles and responsibilities, staffing model, and impact. As far as roles and responsibilities are uh, concerned, um, all PECs focused on quality improvement. Most had pediatric specific roles in education and pr promotion, uh, supply oversight, community collaboration, and protocol review. Uh, 
pediatric education includes the didactic portion, the hands-on and or simulation. Uh, the QI includes case review and feedback. Community collaboration includes hospital and public outreach, injury prevention, and family-centered care. Uh, and other items include uh, pediatric research, online pediatric medical control, uh, and community paramedicine or mobile integrated health care. Uh, one of the quotes uh, that we took from this is that we all have different roles and different pieces of the pie as far as looking at different aspects of the pediatric population, both for education, quality assurance, and research. For the staffing model, most PECs were full-time EMS agency paramedics or physicians, and many had responsibilities integrated into existing roles. Uh, so 93% uh, shared the role uh, with others, and that was at least the EMS chief or coordinator and the medical director. 93% uh, uh, did this in addition to their other responsibilities. Uh, one agency had, uh, that we interviewed had one person fulfilling this role, although I do know that uh, since that interview they have added a, uh, a, another person to help uh, them out. And other responsibilities that uh, were listed were the administrator or the director of the service, the education coordinator, training officer, clinical manager, the quality management officer, uh, a regional PEC, uh, the supply and pharmacy control officer, or a lieutenant or captain. So again, another quote, obviously I'm tied with other duties, but we wear a lot of different hats, so we have a lot of different functions. We took a team approach with it and utilized a little bit of everybody. So as far as the benefits of a PEC uh, that were listed, were the uh, main benefit was enhancing provider confidence with pediatric patients. Uh, this is uh, done through uh, pediatric education and training. Um, the staff is more comfortable with pediatrics, uh, saying that having this position helps make pediatrics less scary. It decreases the level of tension and stress for their paramedics on pediatric calls, and uh, they have all the tools that they need, and they're not second-guessing themselves on those pediatric calls. Again, QAQI is done through case review and patient follow-up. And the PEC is seen as a subject matter expert, uh, someone that the medics can turn to with questions about pediatric care and issues. Um, other benefits listed were they help with protocol and policy development, they're a champion for pediatric care, and they increase patient and public education. So probably coordination of all of the different aspects to this and what it really boils down to is what can we do to provide better patient care? Um, so I will let you know that our abstract uh, for this study was accepted for a poster presentation at the annual National Association of EMS Physicians Conference. Can I, you need me to look at it? And our goal is to have the manuscript submitted for publication by the end of November to the Journal of Pre-Hospital Emergency Care. Hi everybody, uh, this is Terry. So, Let's see, let's talk about why are we here. So we have a definition here of what a learning collaborative is. Uh, you can read that, I don't need to read it for you. But the primary objective is um, making sure that we work together collaboratively. And that means having an opportunity to talk over some period of time, develop um, a topic, how we're going to approach it and then create some action plans and with the team so that we can come back to the organization where we work and test anything that we come up with. Uh, whoops. Thank you. <laughs> Here is uh, the map of the nine states that have been awarded the, uh, the supplemental from HRSA on, on your NOFO on participating in the pre-hospital pediatric emergency care coordinating learning collaborative. Um, you can see all the states listed there. We're very excited to work with all of you, and I'm looking forward to uh, seeing how things are different. I, I think it's, this is a nice cover of the whole country, and we get a, get a good taste of how everything's going on. We've divided you into three teams, conveniently, since there are nine of you. 
And each team or group has uh, one member of the uh, tech LC admin team here at EIIC assigned to help with any kind of technical assistance and questions. And we also have a group of subject matter experts assigned to each of these teams. What we're planning to do, and you can see the list here on, on who is uh, responsible for what group, that doesn't mean that you can't reach out to anyone you wish, so we're all happy to help however we can. Um, as a team, we're planning on meeting about once a month in addition to these learning sessions uh, just to check in with you individually to see how things are going. Uh, we are terming these pulse checks. We're borrowing that from the PRQC, which I think many of you are familiar with, uh, to check in, see if you're having some barriers, some challenges, how we can help you, and our SMEs will also be on these meetings. Uh, the one exception is we will not be having a meeting in January because we'll be meeting in person. Oops. Too many? Uh, this is the, how we've designed the uh, collaborative. You can see along the top, it, this is not a, structurally like a reporting structure. It's more about how we're working across uh, subject areas with various individuals, so including HRSA. We have an advisory committee, our subject matter experts, and of course those of us here at the EIIC. We work together collaboratively to help direct and advise the entire collaborative. So coming back down to the three of us who are serving as the admin team. And then we work with you as the state team to provide you with that oversight and hopefully the, the wisdom that we gain from having a larger group involved. Um, Here are our four phases of the learning collaborative. So right now we're starting just getting things going, figuring out what the baseline is for their PEC roles and responsibilities. We're moving into development and orientations, uh, such as having this meeting, getting to know one another, and getting some basic information from you. Uh, mobilization uh, will come next when we have our first learning session on October 25th. And then the in-person workshop is going to be January 30th through February 1st, 2019, at the AT&T Conference Center in Austin, Texas, the same place where we had our uh, grantee meeting in was April, May of this year. Um, so you are aware we are going to be hosting this in conjunction with the PRQC, who is having their in-person meeting in as well. Uh, so there will be several of us there. There will be a bunch of us there. And uh, I don't anticipate there will be a lot of crossover between the two, but just so you're aware. Uh, at the session, we're planning to share best practices, what we've discovered so far since this, the beginning of October 25th. Uh, and the intent is that you'll be testing and implementing your ideas in between each of these learning sessions. And the check-ins, the pulse check-ins, will be between those to see where you're having issues and see if there's anything we can help you with. Whoops, one too many. There we go, project timeline. Uh, this is just a, an outline of what we proposed when we submitted our proposal to HRSA. Uh, as you can see, it is jammed, packed, and we've got a lot to do between now and January. Uh, so we're going to be very aggressive with this and move as quickly as we can. You're going to get a lot of emails from us. You're going to get a lot of assignments, work assignments. Uh, we're hoping that it will be the person that you've designated as the lead, the person who is going to get the bulk of all its communication, is ready, prepared to disseminate the information more broadly. Uh, if you find that uh, that isn't working, please let us know right away so that we can address it. We don't really have the time to let things linger. Uh, we also want to uh, request very kindly that you respond to our e emails as quickly as possible, just because we do have such a tight timeline. Uh, and so check your junk, junk folder <laughs> a lot. We're going to have learning sessions in October, November, and December. These are all lead up 
to our in-person meeting in Austin. Um, come March, we're going to conduct a survey with the state partnership teams. That's the official end of the collaborative to determine how you've been able to uh, implement your work plans, your ideas, and what effect it's had on the number of PECs in your state. Thank you so much for that. So this is Mark. I am going to share with you some information about the definition of a pre-hospital PEC and how we're approaching this from the collaborative. So um, as you see here, the definition of a pre-hospital PEC that was reported in uh, the performance measure that many of you are familiar with states an individual who is responsible for coordinating pediatric specific activities and uh, that is a fairly concise uh, and straightforward definition without much granularity. And it goes on to have a significant amount of granularity in terms of what role that individual could or should have, where that individual may work or be employed, what profession that individual may be of. Um, the piece that has come back from some of our subject matter experts as well as our team is that this pre-hospital PEC definition is singular, meaning that this is talking about a single individual. It does not have the word individuals or the option for that. Our group is currently in discussions with HRSA and uh, EIIC uh, and um, the qualitative data did demonstrate that there was potentially a um, option uh, that would be preferred involving a group of individuals serving in this role in some states. So more information to come about the potential for it to be a group. Uh, I will go on to just provide some information about the roles. Um, so the roles or professions that this individual could have are listed here. If there are additional roles or professions that we did not think of, please go ahead and share them with us. Um, we uh, thought that potentially, depending upon the area, this could be a volunteer or emergency medical technician, a BLS uh, type of trained provider, a paramedic uh, trained provider, as um, some states have worked towards within a training agency or region. Um, a nurse, a nurse practitioner, a physician assistant, or a physician, an MD or a DO. Um, if these individuals may serve in a variety of roles within their job. So some may be, uh, for example, a trauma program manager for a region. Others could be a manager of an ED or a hospital-based pediatric emergency care coordinator that has already been identified as serving a region that might be a nurse or a physician role. That individual could have a, a duplicative uh, set of responsibilities that match their hospital-based responsibilities in a EMS uh, pre-hospital setting. Others have talked about a region-wide approach. So if there are EMS regions within your area, potentially having a single individual, or uh, as we mentioned before, the option of a group of individuals that may be on the table for a region of a state. Uh, the uh, individual or individuals could serve a single hospital or agency. Uh, again, they may serve a group of hospitals or agency. Another uh, option that some states have proposed and explored is a state entity such as the Department of Health or the EMS um, committee within that state or a structure such as a health system. Um, I see someone listed here, a clinical nurse specialist. Uh, if there are other terms, please go ahead and share those. I know for a physician, MD was on there. That was not meant to be exclusionary. DO could be included as well. And this uh, crosses the gamut from pre-hospital providers where there is a, a wide array of nomenclature to hospital-based providers. Uh, and um, certainly our intent is to be inclusive, not exclusive. So advanced practice uh, nurses or uh, advanced practice professionals such as physician's assistants, thank you for sharing that. 
So the responsibilities of this individual are uh, listed in the performance, not listed in the performance measure, they are listed in a variety of other places. And this is really, I think, a critical element of this work that the responsibilities do not say that this individual must do all of these things. The documents actually state could do. So I, I did want to make sure that the uh, groups on the call are aware that um, the balance of what this individual is expected to do may be customized by that individual and or your state. So ensuring that pediatric perspective is included in the development of protocols, ensuring that uh, EMS providers follow pediatric clinical practice guidelines that may be through a QI or PI type of approach, um, promoting pediatric continuing education opportunities, whether they're local or regional or potentially national opportunities, overseeing pediatric process or performance improvement, ensuring the availability of pediatric medications, equipment, and supplies. And I would highlight, similar to the hospital-based pediatric readiness work, you need the equipment, supplies, policies, and procedures as a building block to move towards teaching how to use those equipment medications, supplies, policies, and procedures. So depending upon where an EMS agency is within your state uh, or where your state is related to EMS, this may vary. I know some of the states participating have statewide guidelines that uh, the individuals involved as the PECs could have input to, but the same pediatric guidelines exist across the state. Additional responsibilities that are included are promoting agency participation in pediatric prevention programs or community-based work, promoting agency participation in pediatric research efforts. Uh, some of our states have uh, a PCARN or Pediatric Emergency Care Applied Research Network no pre-hospital node uh, that is involved in research, liaising with the emergency department coordinator. As I mentioned before, uh, there's an option where that emergency department coordinator could be serving in this role. If they are not, it is uh, imperative that that individual is in communication with the pre-hospital pediatric emergency care coordinator uh, so that we can make sure that the individuals working on this across the continuum know what each other are doing promotes family-centered care within the agency, and um, really that, that's uh, the um, summary of the responsibilities. So I had mentioned the professions, the employer, are, um, uh, or really uh, where that individual works or whom they work for, and the responsibilities. Again, to reiterate, at this point in time, the verbiage for the, or, or the wording of the performance measure states individual. Um, there is a discussion and uh, we will certainly be in touch if the preferable approach in your state or region is a group. Uh, and we do not want to um, say that any um, specific uh, approach is what is required. As an improvement collaborative, we're hoping to have uh, different approaches and learn from each other. So thank you so much for the opportunity to share that. Thank you, Dr. Arbuck. So as far as upcoming events are concerned, um, the state team leads or the point of contact should have received uh, outlook invitations for these upcoming meetings and learning sessions. If you did not, please contact me. This is Sam. Please contact me and I will make sure that you uh, receive that outlook invitation and then we would ask as the state team lead or point of contact that you make sure that the rest of your team uh, receives that uh, invitation that you forward that on to them. So the first learning session is coming up on October the 25th. And our plan for that is that our subject matter experts will be presenting a vision for a pediatric emergency care coordinator in the pre-hospital setting. Uh, what we're finding is that some of you are very far along in your process and have been developing recruitment processes for PECs long before this collaborative was ever even uh, thought of. And then some of you are just now starting out, uh, which is fine. And we want to make sure that we capture everybody in, in this process. So we do ask for, for everyone's patience, understanding, and flexibility as we move forward. Uh, learning session two is on November 15th. Learning session three is on December the 13th. Um, and our plans for that is that the team members will learn from one another 
as you all report on your successes, uh, any barriers that you are encountering, and lessons that you've learned. And the aim is to build collaboration and support as you uh, try out new ideas. And then, as we have mentioned uh, earlier, uh, the in-person workshop will be in Austin, Texas uh, at the AT&T Center. Um, and uh, January 30th will actually be a travel day. The, the uh, actual workshop will be the 31st and February 1st. Uh, and during that, we plan on asking you to share what you've learned over the previous three months by pulling together those best practices. And as far as that um, workshop is concerned, uh, probably one of the questions that you all have is uh, as far as when you'll be able to register for the hotel and whatnot. Uh, we don't have that just yet, but as soon as we uh, have all that pulled together, we'll forward it to you just as soon as we can. Okay, now for the fun part. What we have coming up next, or next steps, homework. So first we'll start with, we've created an introductory packet for each of you that includes a lot of information on, it has a directory, it has resources, so a lot of the publications that we've discussed or mentioned here, uh, information from the NEDARC from the survey, from the PM0203 survey, um, state information on each of the states participating. I think that's most of a general overview of the objectives, the aims. Uh, we'll be sending that out to you. It is a large file. We'll probably zip it up to send it to you. But it will also be posted to the EIIC website. I'm going to post it later this afternoon because uh, there's a couple little tweaks that we need to make. And then I'll send out the link so you can all get there and take a look at it. Keep in mind that we are also, the EIIC is in the process of uh, redesigning our website. So right now what you will be seeing will be fairly bare <laughs> and sparse, but totally functional. So everything will be up there for you so you have access to it. Uh, take a look at that. Become familiar with it. Then your first two homework assignments. Uh, you've all received the survey link. It's a red cap survey. Uh, we are asking that each of you, each team, identify five different agencies that you know have a PEC, including the one which you have uh, worked with to help become a member of your team, essentially. So that be that one you've got all the information on, so there will be four others you'll need to uh, share with us. And then we also want you to identify at least five agencies in your state that express an interest in having a PEC. Those are the ones that we are be looking toward as we're working on our, our work plans, our implementation plans, and best practices uh, to because they're, they're on the cusp. They're ready. They want to get started. I appreciate that that may seem like uh, a task that is is overwhelming, but all this information should be available to you from your NEDARC survey and the EMS survey. Everything should be in there. We don't have access to that. We would like for you to share with us so that we can have a better understanding and appreciation of what your challenges may be, what the landscape is. Uh, is it urban? Is it rural? Is it a real mix of independent? paid, volunteer, that will help us a lot as we're, as we're working on this project. We really, really, really would like for you to have all of it to us by the end of business, Friday, October 19th, so that's a week from this Friday. So we'll have it together to share on our first learning session on October 25th. So I'm sorry, can, okay, thank you. For some reason I'm not able to control it. So in addition to that homework, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we'll be setting up each uh, EIIC person that's going to be who's assigned to your group will be meeting with you virtually to set up some dates for these monthly check-ins. And of course, we have to coordinate a lot of people's time and calendars uh, with the SMEs involved. So you'll be hearing from us very soon, like the next couple of days to get that set up. Um, in addition, we have set up another 
Red Cap survey. And this one is going to be easy to do. We just need you to go in and fill out information on the members of your team. So we have a nice resource and can make sure that our directories are up to date as we share them with all of you. And then finally, as I mentioned, the web page. The link is here. That is live. You can go in there. Uh, I will be uh, creating some more pieces to it, and it will become more robust and I think more useful to you as, you, as, as we move along. If you have any questions about any of that, please do use the chat box. Or if, I don't know, do you want to open it up to questions? Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, that uh, Cassidy, if you could go ahead and unmute everybody, and if anybody has uh, any questions, uh, we intentionally left about 10 to 15 minutes here uh, to try and answer any questions that you all have. All right. Questions are open. As far as the chat box is concerned, Dr. Arbach has done a fantastic job of responding to folks as they have submitted questions or comments. So we do not have anything on the chat box as of yet, but feel free to continue to use it. Hi, this is Erica Kane from Wisconsin. Um, I have a question. I'm very curious to hear from the other states what your plans for staffing um, for this learning collaborative are. We, in our um, grant application, discussed having a short-term contracted project manager who would be in charge of this um, this endeavor, but I'm, I'm curious about what other folks are doing. So any state, pick a state. We have eight states. If someone wants to comment, um, I, I, I can. Um, I this can. is Martha from New York. Thank you. Uh, we are using a uh, program agency. We have 18 EMS regions in New York, and we contract with an agency in each of those regions to um, be our extension of the state. And one of those regions has stepped up to assist us with this, and she is planning to hire a uh, program coordinator for this collaborative. So yes, we, we plan to contract part of this out. So Montana is also contracting it out. We have a pediatric liaison and he was working part time so now he's going to full time. So that's how we're using that resource. Thank you. All right. So we do have a question. For the agencies you want us to submit to the survey, I just want to confirm you want us to take the information from the EMSC survey and enter it. Uh, I'm sorry, Cassidy, could you repeat that for me, please? Certainly. I think it's just a clarification question. For the agencies you want us to submit to the survey, I just want to confirm that you want us to take the information from the EMSC survey and enter it. Yes, that is correct. And another question, can the emails to team leads be specifically identified so that we know what needs to be forwarded? We are getting a lot of emails right now. That was a request. Can I? Uh, I'd like so this is Terry. I'd like to suggest that maybe those of you on the call type into the chat box how you'd like that subject line in the email to read, so that we can set it up that way, so that it'll grab your attention rather than just falling in with the, the muck of everything else that's in your inbox. And, and this is Mark. I, I think that there's a variety of communication strategies that could or would work depending upon what structure you're using within your state. Uh, and I'm not sure if I'm reading into Joe's email, but if a better approach would be to send it to the team lead and let the team lead take responsibility for communicating that to other constituents, um, please let, let us know, uh, you know your preferred communication strategy. I, I appreciate that uh, with 
the large size of some of our teams, uh, perhaps uh, you know, it's not necessary for every single person on the team to be included on every email. Exactly what Carolina said. Carolina said. <laughs> This is Morgan. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, just responding back to Erica's question, um, because the way we're approaching it's different than what I've heard so far. Um, everything here will roll through me as the team lead for the project, and we are trying to bring in people um, from different areas of the state who are going to be individual PECs from agencies that will help with outreach. We've got some other staff in our office that will be doing a little bit of education for me as far as familiarizing agencies with the PEC position and role and the need for it, um, but pretty much everything will roll through my office. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments? Sam, my only comment would be um, just a, a, as a, um, a, I guess, personal uh, a story from the uh, facility recognition collaborative. All of a sudden, many of these travel commitments um, pop up on us, and uh, I do want to reiterate that Sam provided those dates, and that the expectation from the um, request for proposals, at least my understanding, and Sam, you can let me know if this is not correct, was that each uh, participating state that was awarded the funds would be sending three individuals. Um, or more if, if they choose to send more, but there is a requirement to send three individuals. Uh, I, I, I do think that that um, piece of information in terms of sending an individual versus three individuals is important to differentiate. Yes, so the, to our, the, the way we understand it, and I believe Sarah from HERS is on the line as well, uh, you all should be uh, coming at least the 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 team lead, uh, your identified PEC on the team, and at least one other person, whether that's another PEC or a fan rep, uh, your state EMS director, whoever uh, of your choosing to, to bring. So it should be at least three folks from your team. Hi, it's Erica from Wisconsin again. Um, I would just ask, I know it was mentioned previously in the call that um, the meetings for this learning collaborative will be held in conjunction with the PRQC meetings. Um, I know in Wisconsin we do have, we'll have quite a bit of um, overlap between folks that are involved with both. Um, so I just ask for your thoughtfulness with scheduling so that we can participate um, as much as possible in both meetings. Hey, Erica, this is Terry. So I'm uh, somewhat involved with the PRQC as well, and I did see that there's going to be a lot of overlap actually here and there. Um, and I've shared that with the PRQC team as well so that we can be mindful of that as we, as we make our plans. So we are working together. We aren't working in silos, believe it or not, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to accommodate everybody. Thank you. Does anybody have any other questions or comments? Hi, it's Erica again. I always have lots of questions. Um, so in, our, in the NOFO and when we were working on our grant applications, the evaluation section um, was pretty in-depth with um, intent to learn more about the barriers to having PECs and some of that um, qualitative um, information beyond just whether or not agencies had added PECs. In the learning, the upcoming learning session is Will evaluation be addressed a little bit more in depth? Um, I guess I'd just always like to think about that on the front end of a project before we get going too much. Is 
this is Sam. I think um, a lot of what you are asking, uh, yes, some of it will be uh, addressed in the learning sessions, but uh, we're also going to have those offline pulse checks to where uh, we'll be able to probably address some of those uh, concerns a little uh, better um, and have a little more open dialogue about that type of thing. Cool, thank you. Um, everyone, this is Terry again. I just have a general question for everyone on the line. Uh, it would be, <laughs> Sarah, that's funny. Uh, it would be useful <laughs> if. Um... Thanks, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just saw that. Uh, gosh, I do that all the time. I would, I as a member of the team, and I think probably the other members of the team would appreciate hearing from you all some of the best ways, as Dr. Arbark alluded to, to communicate with you. So we're doing this. This is a didactic approach with the webinars. Um, but if there are other approaches or other tools or methods or anything else that we might employ reasonably, uh, we would love to hear from you because we want to make this as useful for you as it possibly can be. Hi, it's Erica. Um, I think it's really helpful after webinars like this when we get follow-up emails that um, summarize any changes in timelines that have occurred or any um, items that we need to keep in mind on our to-do list. Um, so I know a lot of information is, is being shared, but that quick um, bulleted summary can be really helpful, especially when uh, the state program managers and the project leads relay this information to the rest of our team that um, isn't always able to participate in the webinars. Sure, um, and, and I'm just taking some notes here. I think, uh, yeah, I think that's a good idea, and we can definitely uh, provide that to you all. And from from uh, in asking for that, you would want sort of a cliff notes with time with important upcoming timeline. Is that sort of um, what, uh, am I hearing that correctly? So, you know, maybe like a one page document that says, you know, he, here's some cliff key take home points from the call, and here are upcoming deadlines. Yes, yes, um, cliff notes or the highlights only, um, like Terry mentioned, um, would be helpful immediately after the, the webinar, or as soon after as is feasible. I know this isn't your only project that you all are working on, too. Thank you for that idea. Sure. And also, just to let you all know, the webinar is being recorded, and it will be available on uh, the web page. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we can send the link to the webinar to the, the team leads or points of contact, and you can uh, disseminate that to the rest of your team as well. I, I have a proposal. I don't know if this is giving more work to the nine states, but uh, as the group that's organizing this, we're sort of deep in the weeds. Might it be possible for someone, that we could potentially even rotate this, but someone to, to serve in that role of saying these were the five take-home points uh, I believe are critical. Uh, I'm just wondering if coming from a participant rather than our core group, we could sort of cross check that, but I think it would be really useful um, to hear from the constituents sort of what you're taking away, even if it was just a brief note from today's session where someone sent Terry, you know, these were the five things I, I think are critical to, to communicate with my team. Uh, at least in my mind, that might help us um, understand sort of what information we should distill down to. Um, do you mean that you'd ask for us to do that over the phone on the webinar or 
Um, I'm not sure of the exact process. Terry, I don't yeah. know if it would be useful for you, but, but my thought would be, um, you know, if there were a set of take-home points, it's almost like the wrap-up session after a lecture, you know, um, helping us to understand if we achieved the objectives. I don't know if it's possible even at the end of the webinar, tell us the one or two salient points in the chat box. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think how to best execute it, but... Oh, um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Chat box would be... Easy for us all, all to do and um, to all sh all share. Yeah. Yeah. So Terry, uh, I guess what I'm trying to propose there, and, and perhaps it would work, perhaps it wouldn't. You know, please list the one or two take-home points uh, that you will be bringing back to your team, and we could schedule that sort of within the last 30 seconds of the webinar, potentially even right now for this one, and people could post things, and that will help us know. Did we get our message across as well as sort of what were what were the priority items to the uh, attendees? Yeah, I was just actually thinking it might be useful for the next webinar to have that as the opening. These are our five objectives. This is what we hope you you understand at the end of this webinar, and these will be your five uh, homework assignments. And then uh, near the last ten minutes of the webinar, I can type in the uh, chat box what I heard and see if everyone else heard that as well and give us some feedback. Sounds great. Okay, well we do want to be respectful of everybody's time um, and I do have uh, 12.30 my time, 1.30 on the East Coast. Uh, However, I am willing to stick around for a few more minutes if anybody else has uh, any other questions or comments. Otherwise, uh, we appreciate you all joining us here today. And uh, again, we look forward to working with everybody. And yes, 11.30 in Montana. <laughs> Go team. <laughs> Talk to everyone soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>